So there's low-tech universal design for learning and high-tech. The low-tech would be asking for a step stool and getting it without anyone asking for documentation or worrying about OSHA if I fall off and I'm on video. If I do, I'm sure you'll see it on YouTube later. <laughs> so let's talk about some more acronyms and get into our alphabet soup. I would like to introduce you to Universal Design for Learning by introducing you to McKinsey Grace. McKinsey Grace came into the world in September 2004 full of determination to build her own, build her own awesome. Like the rest of us, her path is not a straight line. There's some curves, there's some obstacles. In the K-12 system, a lot of learning happens through play. There's a lot that goes on on the playground that she doesn't have access to. Now, before you look in your schedule and think, I didn't want to come to a K-12 section, I'm in higher ed, bear with me, we're going to get there really quickly. She is determined that she is going to take those obstacles and get through them. And with a lot of help, really good insurance coverage, and a whole team of experts, she's getting to a better place. So now she's falling into the invisible disabilities category. She can walk, but only for a certain amount of steps a day. She's going to make it. She, it's, the best way to describe it is like an electric car, a really awesome electric car. She can only go for so far, and she has to remind people of that when the teachers say, you have to get up and participate in this relay race. She has to be her own advocate and be able to say, but that means I may not make it through the evening. Because we have access to a lot of experts, we've been able to learn that there's little things that make a big difference for her. One of them is access to cold water during the day. You don't see ice in the glass because her school doesn't have an ice maker or a cafeteria. I was told by the school I would need a 504 plan for her to be able to have water in the classroom. The district nurse was explaining me through all of the legalities, and I was familiar with a lot of the terminology because I came to higher ed from working as a trial consultant and for a litigation firm. I know the legal terminology, but I was really distracted and stuck on a 504 plan for water. A 504 plan is to give accommodations for a student with disabilities, quote, identified under the law. And it starts getting really technical for parents. Some of the labels that have been attached to her are not qualified under the law as part of 504. She has so many labels that have been slapped on while they're trying to figure out what's going on. She has labels that do qualify, so we've been able to meet with her whole team of professionals to get a written plan so that she can have a glass of water in the afternoon when she's warm in the classroom. A 504 plan for water. We're not immune to this in higher education. If you look at our websites, you'll see this legal terminology that says it is the student's responsibility to come to whether you call it access services or disability services and provide documentation for the needs they have. I have a different philosophy. It is the student's responsibility to learn. It is my responsibility to set up an environment conducive to that learning. That doesn't mean that access services is not needed. Whatever your school calls this department, you still need them. No one that's talking about universal design for learning is saying we can replace these services. Think of it as an enhancement. Think of it as water without requiring documentation. How are you going to do this? Reach out to the resources you have available. The greatest thing about being an adjunct, there's few, but the greatest thing <laughs> about being an adjunct is I have access to fantastic people at three different schools that set up great training for me to know these things, and I would say, show up. Now, at this point, I teach public speaking, and I would say to my students, you're not talking to your audience. You did show up. This is a different format because this is going to be broadcast to other people beyond this. But for you, raise your hand if you're from Washington. Wow, good turnout, Washington. I know that you're here on your week off. <laughs> if you're here because you have been given time off from work to come, give those people your drink tickets. 
<laughs> no, I know that if you're here because you're out have, giving time off from work, that you're going to go back to work and you're going to have a full inbox. So I appreciate you two for being here. But for those of you watching this past the conference, if you really want to be awesome, show up to stuff. I hear we're going to have this training. We don't know if someone will come. They're not going to be awesome. I contacted Canvas. Part of UDL would be putting in captions or providing a transcript. I prefer the transcript for those that need it. Canvas said, we're going to do that. Woohoo! Don't reinvent the wheel. Use the resources you have to help you. A lot of people hear Universal Design for Learning and think, I've heard a little bit about that. That's about accessibility. It is about accessibility, but it's about so much more. That's really just the starting point. The more I add Universal Design for Learning techniques into my class, the more everyone is happy. The whole class is more engaged. The whole class is more successful. They're happier. Your valuations will go up. So let's recap really quickly what Universal Design for Learning is in a really tiny format, because I want to get to the life application part that's very important to me. You're going to present the information in different ways. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. You want to provide multiple ways for students to demonstrate what they know. If your class is full of nothing but multiple choice quizzes, that's bad course design. You want to engage the students in multiple ways. Be inspiring. Be motivational. Find ways to say, yes, you can. So start with hello. <laughs> I don't know why it took a Quality Matters class for me to know that I needed to do this for my students. <laughs> As a communication instructor, I can tell you that about 90% of communication is nonverbal. I understand if you're not wanting to be on film, so you're showing the screen and not yourself or putting up another picture. Your students are missing out. When they don't see your gestures and your facial expressions, it really makes a big difference. I start with a video explaining, introducing me and introducing the course, but then also all that wonderful help I've been given, help those people back because our e-learning and access services people, they're overworked too. So share that information with your students and with other colleagues by making videos. In Washington, we have access to Tegrity. All three schools that I'm at are brand new to Canvas. They've set up wonderful training for the students, for those that come. The majority come to class not having gone to this training, and they're flooding the help desks with questions. I have videos start here. This is the way you set up your notifications. This is the way you're going to submit your assignments in Canvas. Ask me those questions first, because I can probably give you the answer instead of going to the other people that are so flooded with calls, and most of them are from me. So <laughs> I want to give them that time back by helping spread the information to multiple people to reduce that phone call. OER, we've heard a lot of acronyms today. I'm in the military world. I'm an Army spouse. I am very comfortable with acronyms. And you may look at your schedule and think, I came to the UDL and this is the OER. Open Educational Resources helped launch me into UDL. In my mind, they are married because when you use open educational resources, you have such a high level of customization. You're not going to find that one piece that's already put together that everything matches your learning objectives. Because if you're doing your course design right, you're starting with your learning objectives, and the learning objectives are varying from school to school and state to state, so the resource is not going to be ready to hit everything. You've got to pull the individual resources to match those objectives. I have a text offered free to the students that I can go in and delete sections. I can add sections. You want to pitch your tent where they are and make sure the student that you're trying to meet as many needs as possible. I have students who love the digital books. It's in a PDF format that via Canvas they can have access to it on their phone or their tablet or that they can also go in and highlight parts, make notes, do annotations. I also have students that really want that paper version. I'm one of those people that straddle between, I love technology and I want to read books on paper. So I went to the campuses to check it out and found out and discovered you could print the whole thing out and put it in a binder for under 
that still saves them over $100 from the t traditional text, and I'm meeting their needs where they are. If you want the paper, we got that. If you want the online, we got that. A lot of the free resources are still digital only. Keep digging, keep looking. Go to places like Kaleidoscope. Tacoma Community College has an amazing open OER site that will take you around to where you find these materials. Keep searching until you find one that has the print rights free for the student. In addition to my videos, I use a lot of TED. The students love it. You don't have to worry about copyright. They share everything. They're so well done. They're the most fantastic, fantastic presenters. It gives the students a really good example of what a good presentation looks like. I get emails from students, thank you so much for this video. I showed it to my spouse. I'm going to download this on my computer and keep this. Amy Cuddy's TED-Ed will teach you that if you have a presentation coming up, sneak into the restroom and power pose for two minutes. We already knew that, that for a long time that nonverbal communication impacts how your audience perceives you. Cuddy's research shows that your nonverbal communication impacts how you see yourself. Let your students stand up for the first two minutes in class if they have a presentation and walk around the room. There's documented science behind this. She tested and the people that power posed, their cortisol stress hormones went down, their testosterone levels went up to a healthy amount, and their presentations were better. Students love this stuff. I didn't have to create this. I didn't have to do the study. It's already there for TED for free. These are the kind of multiple ways you can read it in the text, you can see me talk about it. You can see Amy Cuddy talk about it. You came to see about tools in Canvas. Some of this stuff you could already do. So why am I giving credit to Canvas for stuff that technically I could do? I've worked in four different LMSs because it's so easy now. I used to have all those phone calls. At Olympic College, Tom Jacobs was having to talk me through how to embed a video by going to this little icon, teeny, teeny, tiny icon that was called Page. And you had to know how to get in the HTML code and put in the HTML code. What person that uses common sense would know to go to that little icon that says Page? Who comes up with this stuff? All I have to do in Canvas is copy and paste it in and it embeds itself. That also means my students can do it very easily. It's easy to set up a quiz. What is pathos, logos, ego, ethos? Do, uh, they can memorize, they can answer the question, and they're not gonna remember it five years from now. It's much more fun to get a discussion board, have them post videos that they found. All they have to do is put in the link and it embeds it, and tell them, tell me about the ethos, pathos, logos interact with each other, and it gets them to a much deeper level of understanding, and they actually like it. They're proud to show off what they found and what they know about it. Tables. Kathy Bride at Olympic set up this wonderful training for Melissa Sales. Who sh she was showing us a text-heavy course. She was bringing up the module view as what not to do, and I was looking at it and thought, that looks like my course. <laughs> I, from now on, will use this table view. And then Lilia Murray, Lilia Murray at Murray State University is like, yeah, I can show you how to put that alt text automatically in so the screen readers will read it. Because I do have students without vision. And you want to have in mind all your students when you're putting together these resources. There is a way that students can do their assignments via video in Canvas. It's easy. If they have their webcam and computer on, it automatically happens for them. You demonstrate it in class. They love getting to do this. It makes perfect sense in a public speaking course. They have to evaluate their peers. They have to do a self-evaluation. I video their speeches. They have to watch their speeches and tell me what they see they could do better before next time. Why not have them turn on and tell them, I am going to be watching 90 of these. I don't want you rambling. Practice it as a speech. I want you to get to at least one minute. I want you to stay under five because I have a life too. And then you can sit and get a dual monitor, have them going on the second monitor. You can listen to them and see how they're doing. But it's not just for public speaking. Your students are giving presentations in other classes. Let them practice that. In the interpersonal class, I want to know that they can write well. That's also important. And in a way, it's built into the learning objectives. So I'll make it half and half. Give the students choice. Half of these assignments you can do via video or audio. 
I don't require them to put themselves on camera. I'm okay with the audio, especially in the interpersonal class. They really love when you do this for them. My advice, if it's a speech or a presentation, grade with that media feedback. I say media instead of video because I think sometimes you should do audio only, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. If it's a paper and you have access to something like Tegrity or an, a, another form that catches your screen, the students love when they're grading the papers. Make sure integrity that you go to your personal account and not the class account so they're not seeing each other's grade and feedback. Put it in your personal account, save it with the student's name so you'll know which one to send them the link to. Bring up the paper, you can highlight and click and you can tell them. This is really great, here's where this needs to be better. The thesis statement needs to move up here. Let me show you the correct way to do a, a, a source in inside of a source with as cited. I apparently don't translate as well in the written form sometimes, and I used to have students showing up to office hours in tears. And I'm like, what's going on? They really like hearing the encouragement versus just seeing the written, it's my job to tell them where they need to be better, but that's hard to hear. And when they have it in the written format, they put their own tone into it. They start perceiving it in a way different than I'm perceiving it. Another big part of UDL is a voice, the students having a say in what's going on, and more choice. Letting them create assignment ideas and finding ways to say yes if that matches your learning objectives. I don't want to bore you with a lot of analytics, but I, would want to, I do want to point out too, this goes back to that, would you rather have my feedback written or in audio? And a majority of the class said yes. I would rather have the audio feedback. And in the little responses underneath, the other, one person said I'd rather have both. One said either, but it was really nice to hear your voice because we could hear your tone. The third one was very enlightening. It depends on the situation. Audio feedback is easier and faster. It felt closer in touch. However, if the audio file is too large, it's hard to access on a mobile device. That was new information for me. Ask your students. Make it anonymous so they feel comfortable. I do a midterm evaluation. Canvas will let you do a survey, give students points for doing it, and be anonymous. But I like yesterday we learned at the keynote, you don't have to create this walled garden. Remember that terminology we heard yesterday? I still use the survey monkey. I'm a student still myself. I'm doing a great program at Seattle University getting a certificate for teaching in higher education. I know that it's not required for us, but the content's making me a better teacher, and it's worth my time. Doing this midterm evaluation lets me have that feedback of knowing midterm what they're doing. When I was doing this as a student, I said, the, uh, the teacher said, you can do this and it's anonymous, and my first reaction was, yeah, right. I just didn't trust it. It didn't feel good. I think it feels safer to the student if you go outside the Canvas tools and use the Survey Monkey. The other is the choice on assignment. Finding ways you have quarters you've used this assignment and quarters you've used that assignment, and there's ways, reasons that you like this one or that one. What about putting them both in there and saying you get to decide which one you want to do? Option three, you can design your own project and you'll get great ideas from your students. As long as they can show me through a proposal they're gonna reach the learning objective, let them do it. Let them demonstrate their knowledge in a way that matches their learning needs, their desire, and their professional skills. The student's gonna be more motivated when they can relate this to their occupation or the occupation they want to go into, and then they can put these projects on their resume also. So for the, the public speaking class, I wanted the students to really understand that rhetoric is not just getting up in front of a group of people like this. So they're also doing interviewing. This student is interviewing a veteran and his family. The interview is gonna to go to the Library of Congress and be in the National Archive. Some of our students are interviewing students that are veterans at Tacoma Community College. Now we have a archive at Tacoma Community College of the students that are veterans and their stories will be preserved. But not all students wanted to do it that way. Some of the, we're coming up on our 50th anniversary soon. Some of the students wanted to interview their favorite teacher. This is Tempest interviewing Dr. Michael. I said, yes, I think that's a great idea. 
One of the other things I do in my classes is the communication lounge. Create a discussion forum that's ungraded, that's just for them that they can go in there and talk about the movie they saw last weekend or whatever fun thing they want to do to just get them more engaged with each other. I allow all of the projects to be done as groups. Group presentations are actually harder than individual presentations. This is a way they can find each other. Who wants to group up with me and do this project on how do you survive a zombie attack for my demonstration speech? And I say, yes, you can do that. <laughs> and they find each other. We have one for this presentation also. This is the link that an instructor sent you a link out. You can go to the Thursday schedule, get to this demonstration, and we can keep communicating with each other and sharing ideas. I had to go fast because of the 30 minute format and couldn't teach each of these things. But if you're like, I don't know how to do that and I want to do it, put it up there, I'll make you a video. Or we'll get in touch with each other and we'll get on join.me and I'll show you how to do it because I wanted to try to throw a lot of ideas in and still have a way that you can communicate with me if you want to talk more. Do we have any questions? Everyone's good to go. Well, then let's take a few minutes, turn to the person next to you, and think of how you could take what you've learned for Universal Design for Learning and change it in, change one of your assignments in your courses.